And now we're going to have a panel on oceans. Hi, um, this is our ocean land connection part of the program. Uh, my name is David Helvarg. I'm an author, executive director of Blue Frontier. I think Miguel, uh, and I'm going to introduce some other salty folks here. Uh, I think Miguel called this panel uh, the soup of life. I, I'd say the ocean is more like a bula base. It's both the soup and the bowl it comes in. It's, um, it was there before the soil. It was, it's the crucible of life, the driver of weather and climate. Um, the planet, if it's 4.5 billion years old, the ocean's been there. It's uh, the, where the chemicals and the minerals combine to create the amino acids and other building blocks of life 4.2 billion years ago. And then fast forward about 3,998 million years and uh, humanoids arrive. Uh, five or six species of humanoids, which uh, quickly, and this is a mystery, we don't know who's responsible, but we end up with just one species, Homo sapiens. And then things are pretty stable in our ocean, on our ocean planet for the next hundreds of thousands, several million years. And then there's this agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, and things begin to get destabilized. And you have the sixth planetary extinction pulse um, in which Turns out we're both the media, like 63 million years ago, we're both the media, but since we're nature made uh, conscious, we're also the planetary defense. Um, we have the knowledge and potential um, to make change. We just haven't uh, developed the, the consciousness to protect our home waters yet. Uh, within the last 100 years, we had the post-agricultural industrial revolution and within my lifetime, kind of a blink of an eye, uh, we've gone from when I was 15, I saw the, uh, my first alien world when I got a mask and snorkel and went out uh, into the Florida Keys and saw shoaling fish and uh, my first hammerhead shark and, and marine reptiles, sea turtles, they were already hundreds of millions of years older than us. They were around when dinosaurs were the coming thing and, and, and got the sense as a kid, I'd been jealous that I didn't get to go to alien worlds. Here's one right off our seawalls. And, and yet, 90% uh, of live coral reef when I was 15 down in the Florida Keys, less than 10% today. Uh, we, uh, 15 years ago, I started Blue Frontier, bluefront.org, and we're talking about cascading disasters of industrial overfishing, of, of oil, chemical, plastic, and the nutrient pollution. Um, and, and loss of habitat, which we need for restoration, and climate change. But we didn't realize how overwhelming that would be, that, that today the marine effects of climate change are changing back to the geological aspects, the physical nature of the ocean, its, its, uh, its circulation, its temperature, its chemistry, even its color. And it's happening as we speak. The disasters are piling up. I've reported on the coral bleaching. We've lost over half our, our global tropical reefs. We're now doing triage. We're fighting for the last 10%. The IPCC, the International, International Panel on uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on September 25th will release a report on um, the ocean, cryosphere, and climate, uh, which is why I want to do a media training for the IPCC. It's basically the ocean, ice, and climate, although after reading it, we're all going to be in a cryosphere. Um, but it says it's leaked, and one of the things it says is flooding impact will, will increase by a factor of, of two to three, which is science speak for 100 to 1,000 times worse. All the storms we've seen from uh, Katrina to uh, Sandy to Dorian, um, that's our future. And so the challenge is how we, how we grow our solutions fast in the problems, and if we can. And I, you know, I wrote one of my books, 50 Ways to Save the Ocean, because everything we do every day affects the seas around us. We can make the changes. We know what the solutions are to overfishing, stop killing fish. They tend to grow back. We know that, that you know, there's an energy revolution taking place, clean, renewable. We know that, that to start sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere, we need resilient soils. We need to plant a trillion more trees. It's not a question of lacking solutions. It's creating the political will to enact them. 
And so, you know, we're all facing this, this dual threat of extinction, climate disruption on the one hand, and celebrity fascism on the other, the, uh, the final, hopefully final, floundering of the dinosaurs of greed and ignorance and denial. And we have a, a modicum of hope. Uh, Gramsci, the Italian anarchist when he was jailed by the fascist, wrote that we need uh, pessimism of the intellect but optimism of the spirit. And what we have is a lot of spirit and a lot of solutions that we need to scale up rapidly. And so that's what we'll talk about today in this panel. I wanna, I'll be introducing you first to Blake Kopcho, who is the senior ocean campaigner at the Center for Biological Diversity. Many of you may know them. They're kind of um, both sue and active, sue as in lawsuits. They're, yeah, they, they take a lot of bad actors to, to court and they also organize a lot of campaigns to protect the incredible diversity of life, both marine and terrestrial. Um, and he's, he's got his background in uh, marine aquatic biology. Most of the plants on earth are out there in the ocean, sucking up the carbon dioxide and giving us, you know, half to two thirds of our oxygen. Uh, right now he's campaigning, leading the campaign against offshore drilling. Uh, Blake will go first, then you're gonna hear from Mary Crowley who's a founder of Ocean Voyages Institute. Um, she's logged over 100,000 miles at sea. She's a real salty person, a, uh, a mariner who's been at it for half a century, which is why she was able to get together with other mariners and develop, you may have seen her in the media recently, she's the first person who actually went out there and took plastic, 42 tons of, uh, of discarded fishing net out of the Pacific. And she's gonna talk to you a little about how we deal with plastic, which is just a petroleum issue. It's again, plastic waste is solidified oil spills. And Dakota is an activist who I've known over three years now, which brings her to 13, uh, one of the founders of Heirs to the Ocean. Uh, can the heirs in the room stand up? I know there's a bunch of you somewhere there. Okay. Go, go talk to them because I've, I've long given up on this idea that, you know, youth are our future. They're, you know, leaders of our future. They're leaders today if we're willing to partner and work with them. And um, she's going to make the, uh, the land-sea connection in terms of uh, nutrient overflow. But uh, so let's start. Oh, and, and I had pretty pictures of people marching and all, but I guess you want to run that for a second until Blake gets up here. Anyway, sorry I didn't cue that, but uh, I'll just, so this is, you know, this is what we're gonna farm in the future, lots of kelp, unfortunately, and this is how we're gonna get there. Okay, Blake Kopcho. All right, am I close enough to this mic? No. Let's see, can I tighten it? Oh, there we go. How about that? Yeah? In the back, can you hear me okay? All right, perfect, thank you very much. Okay, and, ah, excellent. Okay, great. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Uh, again, I'm Blake Kopcho. I'm the senior oceans campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, actually, our office is in downtown Oakland, and I live right here in the city. Currently, I coordinate the Protect the Pacific Coalition, which is a coalition of environmental and environmental justice groups, native nations, and local businesses who are working to stop the Trump administration's proposal to expand offshore drilling, not only off the California coast for the first time since the 1980s, but also in all of our oceans. Uh, that's an aerial photo of some offshore drilling platforms in the Santa Barbara Channel off the uh, Southern California coast. All right, that can work. Oh, I don't know where I aim this, but it worked. Okay. Um, there haven't been any new offshore oil and gas leases off the California coast in decades because of protections that were put in place after the 1969 oil spill 
in Santa Barbara, which at that point was one of the greatest environmental catastrophes that the country had ever seen. Unfortunately, catastrophic oil spills are an inevitable consequence of offshore drilling, as we've seen with the Santa Barbara spill, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989, the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, uh, and more recently, the 2015 Plains Pipeline spill near Santa Barbara. Sorry about the pixelation of that photo, but that's a, that's a picture of a Santa Barbara area beach after uh, a pipeline ruptured that was onshore, but that um, serviced offshore oil and gas platforms, and it spilled 120,000 gallons of oil along Santa Barbara beaches. Um, that's not the whole story. Smaller spills are routine. The U.S. Coast Guard actually documented over 40,000 oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico over the last several decades. It averages out to over 1,000 oil spills a year. Not surprising to any of you, oil spills aren't the only reason to fight offshore oil and gas drilling. From the exploration phase using seismic air gun blasting to the actual extraction process to the transportation via tanker or pipeline to the refining process. Not surprisingly, refineries are often placed in communities of color, um, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. The most egregious example of this is Cancer Alley down in Louisiana along the Mississippi River where over 150 refineries and chemical plants dot a chemical corridor that's become known as Cancer Alley because of the extremely high cancer rates that predominantly black communities face there. Uh, in, in Southern California, some of these refineries are placed in farm worker communities, for example, down in Oxnard. Um, so, the entire process all the way to the actual combustion phase, offshore drilling is a chain of destruction and death from beginning to end. Okay. During the Obama administration, I worked with frontline communities in the Gulf Coast on the Keep It in the Ground campaign to end the expansion of offshore oil and gas drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, because that's where over 99% of drilling in the U.S. takes place. That's a picture of all of the offshore oil platforms and pipelines that connect them uh, throughout the Gulf of Mexico. There are thousands of them littering the landscape there. The Keep It in the Ground campaign won some really big fossil fuel extraction victories, including permanently protecting the majority of the Arctic Ocean from new offshore oil and gas drilling. But unfortunately, Obama threw the Gulf under the bus and scheduled continuous offshore oil and gas leases, uh, lease sales there for the next five years. Um, okay. When Trump got elected, he bowed to industry pressure and put into motion a plan that would dramatically increase drilling, not just in the Gulf, but in all of our oceans. Uh, this is the largest expansion of offshore oil and gas drilling ever proposed in the United States history. The entire West Coast from the border of Mexico to Canada, same thing on the East Coast from Florida all the way up to Canada, the entire Gulf of Mexico. What this map doesn't show is that all around Alaska, as well as the entirety of the Arctic Ocean was also put on the table. So, we formed a coalition right away here on the West Coast and ramped up a campaign to stop his plan in its tracks. We passed 100 local resolutions up and down the West Coast opposing Trump's, billing, Trump's drilling plan. Excuse me. We also passed two bills through the California State Legislature that made it illegal to build any new infrastructure in state waters that would service offshore drilling in federal waters where the new drilling was being proposed. Yeah. And, all right. Thank you. We also organized a massive protest in Sacramento at the one public hearing in California, California where over 500 people came from across the state to say no to new offshore drilling, not just off the California coast, but in, any, in all of our oceans, including the Arctic. These are some pictures from uh, Sacramento that day. There's me with the bullhorn. I prefer speaking on one of those over one of these, but um, sometimes you gotta, gotta do this. Um, Okay, uh, so the great news, and thanks for clapping in anticipation of this, is that a couple months ago the Department of the Interior announced that they would not be pursuing the plan to drill in all of our oceans until after the 2020 election. So, is a huge organizing effort across the country, some key litigation as well that helped us win, but so for now the California coast is protected from expanded offshore oil and gas drilling. Um, just lastly, I want to quickly touch on that, unfortunately, so one thing, the Gulf continues to be thrown under the bus. As I mentioned, the Obama administration has continued to offer lease sales down there. They've been treated as our nation's energy sacrifice zone for too long. Um, there is one threat facing the California coast, which is since that 2015 Plains Pipeline spill that I mentioned in Santa Barbara, the seven offshore platforms that used 
that pipeline to transport oil have been in operational, and four of them are going to be shut down and permanently decommissioned. However, Exxon wants to restart three of its platforms. Uh, these three down here, Heritage, Harmony, and Hondo, it wants to reopen those platforms, first by trucking oil up to 70 trucks a day, seven days a week, um, along windy California coastal highways, and then by rebuilding that pipeline that ruptured back in 2015. We are not going to let that happen. Um, these two proposals are being considered by the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors over the course of the next year or so. We're building a campaign that will make sure that Exxon's platforms remain shut down and they will never drill or frack for oil from them ever again. And once that's done, we're going to ride the wave of decommissioning platforms throughout the Santa Barbara Channel and shut down offshore drilling off the California coast once and for all. Can everyone hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I am, as you heard, a passionate lover of our ocean from uh, swimming, snorkeling, sailing. And uh, as David was mentioning, we live in a time of more natural disasters. and. We feel so for the people that get affected by hurricanes and all the droughts and floods and fires. And I was thinking plastics in the ocean is really a major unnatural disaster that really gets exacerbated by all of the natural disasters. Every time there's hurricanes and droughts and floods, it means more of our plastics wash into our ocean. So um, this slide was actually um, taken out in the middle of the gyre area, not quite halfway between here and Hawaii, a little closer to here, which is where many of the plastics accumulate and that was a hundred and or is a hundred and fifty one foot brigantine that we took out on a series of trips to really investigate. I all this started because people were talking about plastics in the ocean and some people were saying, you know, cleanup is futile. We have to stop the flow. Well Indeed, at this moment in time, at the 2017 UN Conference on Oceans, it was acknowledged that potentially plastics in our ocean was one of our worst environmental issues. And so we need to do everything. We need to change our ways, refuse, throw away plastics, create better ways of packaging, we need to change everything and we need to clean up the billions of tons of trash that are in our global ocean. So I started doing these trips to study the solutions and uh, we've come up with a good one. This just shows some of our early voyages. The other ship out there was a Scripps student ship that went out, so we had 20 scientists on that. We had six scientists with us on Kaisei. And so we learned about the little fish eating plastic and the big fish eating them, and more about how badly the ghost nets affect everything. They became the thing I wanted to concentrate on getting out first, because they kill whales and turtles and fish and um, porpoises and they go against reefs and smother the reefs. So these show various voyages we did as we developed our solutions. Oops. So um, in after our 
main research voyages, we put together a think tank of naval architects and marine engineers and fishermen and ocean industry people, um, oceanographers, and we worked on how we can clean up these things. Because we believed, and it is true, that cleanup isn't futile. I think it must be the plastic manufacturers who want to not end up paying for cleanup that say that. It's that cleanup takes the will to do it. And I believe we're getting more and more of that will because we've had very positive responses to what we've been doing. So there's really five categories of plastics and each one has a slightly different solution. As you'll see as we go on, um, the first category is sort of the ghost nets, the derelict fishing gear that are col called ghost nets because they keep on fishing. They roll over in the ocean. Sometimes you end up with huge, you know, five to 10 ton nets that are 15 or 20 nets combined together. And they kill a lot of ocean life and they cause a lot of damage to shorelines and reefs and they cause damage to vessels out there. Um, then the second category is the floating consumer debris. And I've been out in the ocean and suddenly, you know, none of it is lumped together like an island. But it's like sailing through a big spread out garbage area. And so you'll go be sailing along through five miles and you'll see thousands of those big white laundry detergent bottles or you'll see all sorts of packing straps, or you'll see beer crates, and because the ocean sort of sorts things, you know, not instantly, but over the years that these things are out there. Another category is you unfortunately find lots of crushed plastics in the ocean. They're like, you know, one inch like they've been through a crusher and they'll be in current lines. How they get there is mysterious. Do people take them ashore, crush them, and dump them in the ocean? Do they come off of ships? Maybe both. But one can use oil skimmers set special ways to pick these up. Um, another category of debris is the microplastics, and it is ready for lots of innovation. And we have two really good um, prototypes that we're going to be testing on our next uh, voyage out there in uh, May of 2020. And then the final category is all the rivers of the world and the way they spew plastics. And one can once again use booms and oil technology to keep all of these river pl plastics from uh, getting out into the ocean. Oops. Well, I'll let this one go. This is... Uh, a wonderful sailing cargo ship that sailed out into the gyre um, on May of this year and ended up conducting uh, the largest cleanup done to date of plastics in the gyre. And uh, <laughs> thank you. If you go on our website, oceanvoyagesinstitute.org, you can see four and five minute films that tell you a lot more about our expedition. But both the crew on the vessel, 
Some of the crew here are from Kiribati, some of the crew were European, some American, and everybody felt it was perhaps one of the best things they've ever done in their lives. So, so feeling the excitement of having achieved this and knowing that it was going to be an inspiration for people all over the world to do that. And that's one of the things Ocean Voyages Institute wants to do is to help clean up every place. And so we said that our 2020 expedition has the goal of increasing by tenfold. So we'll be looking to get lots of garbage out of the ocean. We'll be, instead of 25 days, we'll have over three months and we'll have four ships, including this wonderful sailing cargo ship. I mean, it was so nice to have such a low carbon footprint and yet the ship has a 200 ton hold and so we could easily have gotten, had we had enough money and time, double the amount out of the ocean. But it was good to do the largest cleanup to show that it's possible, and we're going onward to lots more. So thank you. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Um, my name is Dakota Peebler. I am 13 years old, and I'm a founding member of Air Store Oceans. <laughs> Air Store Oceans is an international nonprofit organization dedicated to the empowerment, education, and connection of youth globally to protect the waters of our blue planet for us and future generations. I have a huge connection to the oceans and have always had one as someone who's going to be inheriting it. And so the issue I'm going to be talking about is a personal one for me. And that is the overuse of chemical fertilizers. So nitrogen and phosphorus filled chemical fertilizers have been overused for many years. And today they're being overused in golf courses, agriculture, and in our own homes. And actually, the use of commercial fertilizers started many, many years ago, um, including in the pre- and post-World War um, II era. And the issue is, when we overuse chemical fertilizers, a lot of it isn't absorbed by the plants. And a lot of it runs down into water systems, such as freshwater and our coastal marine ecosystems. And in those water systems, stimulates algae, along with the warming of our waters due to climate change. And this algae blooms in large amounts. And the problem is, some algaes produce toxins when they bloom. We have a problem on the California coast due to a diatom called Pseudonychia. When it blooms, it produces a neurotoxin called demoic acid and demoic acid accumulates in shellfish and um, small fish. And when it's consumed, it affects the hippocampus, and that is a part of the brain that is associated with navigation, memory, and emotions. And when humans consume large amounts of demoic acid, it can end up in amnesic shellfish poisoning, which has many different problems, including on um, large scale, um, short-term memory loss, comas, and in extreme cases, death. And then another problem with um, harmful algal blooms for humans is respiratory problems because some algae release their toxins into the air. In, 
animals, dimoic acid causes disorientation, lethargy, seizures, and sometimes death. And this is a problem that is prevalent for sea lions and sea otters. Some of you may know that sea otters are very, very important as they are a keystone species that protects kelp. And kelp is a huge marine ecosystem, provides oxygen for us, and absorbs large amounts of carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. We actually, in 2015 to 2016, California had a large um, uh, pseudonychia bloom up and down its coast, and it went all the way up into Washington. Um, and it was said that demoic acid concentrations in Monterey Bay reached 10 to 30 times the level that would be considered high for a normal pseudonychia bloom. So this is a real problem, and it's happening now, and it's overlooked. Another issue that comes with nutrient runoff due to chemical fertilizers, along with the warming of our waters due to climate change, is dead zones. And that is when we have the algae dying, and when it decomposes, it sucks up the oxygen from the water, and it leaves large areas of um, lifeless water. And we actually have a really big issue of it in the Gulf of Mexico, where every year um, they suffer from a huge dead zone the size of New Jersey. And if you look here, streams and river connect down into the Gulf of Mexico, coming straight from farms and cities. And there is a lot of um, nutrient pollution coming from those areas. Not only is this a problem for our oceans, it's a problem for humans. Like I said, a lot of the excess nitrogen that is not um, absorbed by the plants enters the ocean, and then some of it enters groundwater. And when it enters groundwater, um, it causes many, many problems. And actually, um, the UC Davis Agricultural Sustainability In Institute reported in 2016 that nearly 419,000 tons of nitrogen leach into groundwater every year in California. And contaminated water can end up in a lot of issues. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see them here on the slide. And it's, this issue is happening right here in California. Could the Pescadero heirs please stand up? Pescadero has had a large issue due to um, nitrates that have contaminated their drinking water. And I'm going to read a quote from Shea, who is the leading heir in Pescadero. The town in which I live, Pescadero, California, is a tiny area on the California coast. We have been an agricultural town for many years, and nitrates from agricultural practices gradually have accumulated in local groundwater, and as a result, there is currently a serious issue with access to potable water in Pescadero. Many local ranches have unclean water pipes, and my high school has not had clean tap water for years. The fertilizer runoff issue is not an abstract speculation, but a reality of life to residents of the town I grew up in. This is happening to, this is affecting people now, and it's affecting kids, and it's affecting our future. And it's not an issue that we have, we can afford to look over any longer. It's time for immediate action. Um, I have been working with the Pescadero chapter and my fellow heir Ashlyn on a fertilizer initiative. And this initiative, our goal is to have the amount of chemical fertilizer used in California reduced. And we've been talking to um, federal and state legislators about this issue. We created a fact sheet and we've been presenting and educating the public. Um, and we also have been working with the Ocean Protection Council. And we made a public comment um, about a month ago um, asking them to have their strategic plan for five years um, to have more immediate action for this nutrient runoff problem. And if this is an issue that you believe is important, I ask you to please go to the Ocean Protection Council's uh, website and draft up and ask, and ask them to um, change ob objectives 4.3 and 4.4 to have them take more immediate action to the issues of harmful algal blooms that are affecting our waters and also um, the health of my friends. This is an issue that's affecting everywhere, everyone and we don't have the time to keep just researching. We need to take immediate action because this is an issue that is happening right now.
testing. And you can visit Airs to Our Oceans at www.h2oo.org, and we're also on Instagram and Facebook. I would like to deeply thank David Helvarg for having me here on this panel, but also being a huge supporter of Airs to Our Oceans since the very, very beginning in 2016. And I would like to thank my fellow panelists for the work you're doing to help our generation and the oceans. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Today. Okay, bring, bring the mic with you, Dakota. Bring the mic. So it's always nice when uh, ocean people can get together with terrestrial folk. Um, um, I think, you know, we're going to talk a little and then open it up to you. Um, one of the first things I did when I founded Blue Frontier 15 years ago, um, what happened was uh, basically it was at a point, so a little background and then we'll get your backgrounds because I think we have a directory. The first thing I did when I set up Blue Frontier was create a directory of what I call the seaweed rebels, marine grassroots organizations that have solutions. And as I said before, the challenge is growing the solutions faster than the problems. But there are about 1,500 organizations um, just in the U.S. that are working on ocean and coastal protection. And of course, and, and they're, they're motivated, they're environmental, they're social justice, they're people within agencies trying to make a difference. And they all have stories. And I think a lot of what I've done as a journalist and writer and what we all try and do is, is tell stories. Um, Sylvia Earle, they did a documentary on her called Mission Blue. And before I saw it, I talked to her, I said, what do you think, Sylvia? She goes, well, I kinda, I'm very uncomfortable. I talk to my kids and all. And the way she was acting, I thought like her kids denounced her for not being there for their, and I watched a movie and it's like not like that at all. And I said, well, she said, it's too personal. I said, Sylvia, you love groupers, but most people don't have the passion for groupers that you do. But they will have the passion for a super mom scientist who loves groupers. And you, you tell them why you love them. And, and those are the connections that can be made. One of Blue Frontier's ocean adventurers, um, Margot Pellegrino, is a, a New Jersey mom and uh, read my book, 50 Ways to Save the Ocean and, and Guns, Germs, and Steel, another simple read, and decided that she wanted to do more for her kids. She was an athlete, so she decided to paddle her outrigger canoe from Miami to Maine, after which I convinced her that as long as she was doing the one coast, why not do this one and do Seattle to San Diego? And so last year she completed her third paddle, which was New York to New Orleans, going up the Hudson River, across the Erie Canal, through the lakes and river systems, uh, making those connections between the seaweed rebels stopping every night and, and making those real connections between, you know, water activists. And it doesn't really matter if it's, if it's salty, brackish, or fresh. We're all facing the same problems. We're all facing the same pollutions and impacts on our lives. And in fact, she was just out here to visit her, her brother, who is going through some personal things, and is in the Monterey Herald uh, two days ago because she saw a cormorant struggling in the water. She thought it was entangled in netting, but she got out there and a photographer from the newspaper came by. She was pulling this cormorant whose head's back like this. And, and it turns out it was domoic acid poisoning, but because it's a young bird, they think it's going to recover, so um, she can't help being a hero. And I think, as I say, if you go to bluefront.org and find our directory, you'll find 1,500 organizations that are all started from different kinds of heroes. And why don't I just ask the three of you, what, what personally got you engaged to where you are today? Um, well, as, as I said, I, I grew up in Chicago, so I started sailing on Lake Michigan. and had a passion for it from the time I was about four years old. And uh, I always knew I wanted to sail the oceans. And so I was very lucky because I, after I, I finished uh, college, I moved to California and I did boat deliveries and I did taught on school ships. I was on a big Norwegian square rig ship for nine months and you know the more time I spent on the ocean the more I 
loved and cared about the ocean and and people would say to me how do you do these things you're doing and so I ended up starting a global yacht chartering company doing a lot of sail training programs for youth doing a lot of taking classrooms out to sea so that they could really get the experience of all the life that's in the ocean and, and one thing as a way of, of connecting that I, I didn't say is the wonderful, I mean, the issue of plastics in the ocean is horrific. But the wonderful part of it is that everybody can be part of the solution because the, the problems come from everywhere. Plastic is so light, you can be way inland and if plastics are not disposed of properly, you know, they blow to rivers, watersheds, to the ocean, and they kill all the creatures and cause the pollution. It's another form of oil spill. So everybody that becomes conscious, and, you know, I can tell from being here at breakfast, you had real forks and you had real plates, and I, You know, I so applaud organizers of events that care about being part of the solution and doing things in ways that are nicer and more sustainable. So um, obviously we share a great passion for our planetary environment and I thank you for all the good things you're doing and, and applaud caring for the land in the right ways. So thank you. And again, there's, in terms of, there's a lot of passion in this conference every year that we've tried to connect the ocean because probably the one thing that people think less about than the ocean is soil. Um, And and so, you know, what you've got, the solutions you seek. But let me ask you, Dakota, what between the ages of nine and 10 kind of turned you (laughs) around politically? (laughs) Um, I've always had a passion for the ocean and it started when I was about four and we'd go to the tide pools and we'd look around and look at the sea stars and when I was about eight or nine I took a sailing camp in the San Francisco Bay in these tiny little Pico boats and we were, when we were out there um, a pot of harbor porpoises came up right next to us and it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my entire life so I went home and I wanted to learn more about um, harbor porpoises. So I went home and I started looking into them and what I found was that it had been, it was just recently that they had come back to the San Francisco Bay after being gone for a very, very long time. And I wanted to know more about these beautiful creatures. So I got really into marine mammals and um, one creature that fascinated me the most was the sea otter because not only is it the cutest animal on the planet, it's super, super important. Um, and so I contacted Dr. Melissa Miller, who is a sea otter pathologist, and I got to witness her doing a sea otter necropsy um, where she looked and th- tried to find um, the cause of death. And that was the most amazing thing I've ever done probably in my entire life because I learned so much and it just sparked this passion in me to protect sea otters so that they can be around for my generation and for my grandkids and great grandkids and um, yeah I've, I've worked ever since t- uh, towards the conservation of sea otters and that's what really got me interested in um, the issue of chemical fertilizer runoff because it's an issue that not only is affecting human health but also affecting sea otters that is a very personal subject to me. And Blake, I don't really know your background, so this is a twofer. All right, thanks. Well, I didn't figure out how to be a badass as quite an early age as Dakota did. Uh, I think when I was her age, I was just some punk kid uh, living on the California coast and spending a lot of time in the ocean. Ultimately, I did uh, end up 
getting a master's degree in marine biology, mostly just because I didn't really know what to do after undergraduate, so I decided to keep studying the thing that I loved. Um, but when I was doing my master's, the American Chemistry Council actually successfully, successfully lobbied the California State Legislature to kill a statewide plastic bag ban for the second time. And uh, my, so my master's thesis was on herbivorous fish nutritional ecology, which is a euphemism for vegetarian fish poo. And I spent a lot of time looking at fish poo under microscopes. And I just, there felt, I, I felt this massive disconnect between, you know, the California state legislature being unable to actually protect our oceans by banning plastic grocery bags and me staring at a microscope. And while we absolutely have to base our conservation policies on a foundation of sound science, the public policy isn't reflecting what that science is telling us. And climate change is obviously the quintessential example of this, where we have the largest body of scientific knowledge ever amassed in human history saying we need to do something now and politicians aren't doing anything. And so I got really pissed off and finally figured out a way to actually enact some change and decided to go work on policy and do activism to connect that gap between what the science is telling us and what the public po policy is actually doing. And so I went and actually uh, finished my master's, which was a good decision, but then went and talked to environment California, which was really the grassroots organization uh, leading the charge to ban plastic grocery bags in California, and I knocked on their door and I said, I want a job, and they're like, well, here's a clipboard. You can go knock on some other doors and tell people about the problem and get them to you know, help us pass the bag ban, and I was like, oh my God, seriously? Um, but I did it and started canvassing and then became a canvas director and ran my own canvas office down in San Diego. and. Uh, we ran a super successful campaign down there and finally banned plastic grocery bags in San Diego and then that really catalog I mean there, by that time I think there were dozens and dozens of plastic bag bins in the ci in cities across California but that really led to ultimately banning plastic grocery bags in California um, and you know that I, I finally figured it out of like oh that I'm really angry about all this stuff and if I just actually do some strategic activism uh, that we can win big protections for oceans and I don't know that was probably five or six years ago now and then I don't know, here I am today running offshore drilling campaigns, and so, yeah, that's my story. So, I'm going to put in a book plug. My last book, The Golden Shore of California's Love Affair with the Sea, kind of says that California, you know, when I moved back here, I was like, trapped myself in uh, D.C. for a number of years, and getting home, I'd always talked about, we had these Peter Benchley Awards, and everything was about solutions and how we grow the solutions. And I realized that uh, California is a model solution. We're 40 million people, we're the world's fifth largest economy, and we do well overall with our coast and ocean. The science action forms policy. Uh, we have this democracy of blue interests, and I realized where, where you have the ports and the navy and the surfers and the marine labs, and everybody has this sense of entitlement to their coast and ocean, that's when things can happen. Democracy doesn't guarantee environmental equity, but it's, it's a precursor, it's a requirement. And, and so, for example, on October 18th, we're going to take Blue Frontiers partnered with the Center for the Blue Economy at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies. October 18th, we're going to have about 40 or 50 California leaders on ocean coastal issues to expand on our ocean climate action plan and the next spring go to DC and bring it to the candidates and bring it to the parties party platform and hopefully bring change, new wave, see party 2020, help turn the election and then be ready to hit the ground running or swimming in 2021. So these, these are the visions we're sharing. Um, and like I say, these are th three representatives of 1500 plus groups that are just around the ocean coast to understand we have to uh, have to form broader coalitions with, with the clean water people, with the social justice, with all the movements that will eventually and hopefully bring us to uh, the solutions, which will include resilient soils and, and new agri... IPCC just said we need to change how we produce agriculturally and how we consume our food. And on the 25th, they're going to give us another warning about what's happening to our ocean and our ice at a planetary level. And then the solution's all up to us. And uh, here are some people with some expertise if you have some questions. Okay, let's go, one, two.
Uh, well, that's a really good question, and that's very much what I thought the first year we were going out to do some studies, and we did some cleanup as well. And in fact, I talked to our mutual friend and mentor, Sylvia Earle, to get her advice, and um, you know, she had said the plastics are so toxic to the ocean. You know, when you're removing things, be sure to shake them off and free up any of the life, but it's important to remove the plastics. Um, but actually, surprisingly, though the nets, for example, are real killers, when you're picking them up, you don't find things in them because the things get eaten and absorbed. Like on, on this trip earlier this year, we found the skeleton of a swordfish, a big sword. And that was all we found in the probably 40 tons of ghost gnats. And so, um, you know, I, I, sometimes nets will have little crabs on them, and that's what, you know, we try to, to shake off. But, no, they're, they're such effective killers that, um, you know, I suppose if we get the hundreds of tons, you know, at some point we'll get one that has some fresh prey in it. But, you know, we have very willing people that would get in the water and free up anything that was alive. So unfortunately, the things are killed very efficiently. Okay, another question. So, so the question is what's done? Okay, so we're over-consuming. Anyone want to say anything about Amazon? They suck. They suck. Okay, next question. Back there. Eric, should we, can people hear the questions? Um, my question is, um, where do you put the plastic waste that you're collecting from the ocean, and how do you ensure that it doesn't go back to where you picked it up from? That was the question we wanted. Okay. Um, when we brought the 42 tons of debris into Hawaii this June, um, we gave about a ton and a half, maybe close to two tons, to local artists, um, including the graduate art program at the University of Hawaii, so they could make sculptures and paintings. There's a great sculpture at the Marine Mammals Center in Sausalito in the middle that came from a net we brought in in 2009. So it's very good education to do this with ocean plastics. The rest we um, gave to Snichter Steel, who prepared it and brought it to H-Power, 
where it was turned into steam and went to power houses in Hawaii. However, um, had we wanted to, but we didn't, ship it to Europe, there's a lot of recycling of nets going on in Europe where it's turned into rugs, it's turned into clothing. On this scaled up trip we're doing in 2020, we'll be experimenting with turning plastics into fuel as well as what we did turning it into power, as well as I'd love to start some industries in some of the island groups of the Pacific where there aren't many jobs because you could separate some of the types of nets which could allow the nylons to be recycled one way and other things. So I, I'm devoted to being sure that anything we remove does not get into landfill or does not get into the ocean. And you're right to ask, because sometimes from beach cleanup and things, things end up going in landfills. Fortunately, I hope less and less so. So it's very important to pay attention to where things are going and to create much more efficient ways of recycling and repurposing globally. I spot one of the conference organizers in the back. We have time for one or two more questions. Okay. Uh. Can we go back to non-plastic forms? Sure. Um, I, I'd just like to speak just a, a tiny bit about plastic production, actually, which I, I think gets to your question about keeping it in the ground. Right now in the Gulf of Mexico and in Appalachia, some of the largest fossil fuel companies on Earth are, are investing hundreds of billions of dollars, literally, I think it's two to three hundred billion to build dozens of new facilities that turn fracked gas into virgin plastics. and this is going to be an absolute environmental catastrophe, not just for the climate, but also for the oceans. And so getting to your question, I think the actual way that we stop consuming so much plastic partly is by stop producing so much in the first place, because if we, if we make it, it's going to get used, right? So if, and, and on top of that, if we build these facilities that take frack gas and turn them into plastic, then that drives more uh, demand for the fracked gas in the first place because the infrastructure is set up to use it and turn it into plastic. So I think the, the sort of roundabout answer to your question is we need to keep it in the ground, we need to ban fracking nationwide, and then we need to not build all these new facilities that are going to turn that into plastic. And, and you, you saw in the 19th, with prohibition, we really got America developed a new industry with organized crime. And when prohibition was lifted, the mob shifted to heroin. So I think a lot in the fossil fuel industry, they see that, uh, that petroleum as a fuel is, is going away because the, the auto fleets are electrifying. And so they're seeing a lot of their future sustenance in different forms of plastic. And, you know, from a historical point of view, coal and oil were great, you know, energy systems for the 16th and 19th century. Here in the 21st century, our job is to, you know, kill off the oil industry and move on to what's, what's productive. So I think we have time for one more question, and then, of course, we'll give all our uh, website information uh, up front. And please make any final statements in the form of a question. Well, vacuuming the water wouldn't be good for the other yeah. creatures in it. And so there's, there's different methods. As I said, some use principles of biomimicry. Uh, there's a way you can put a structure in the ocean that we nickname the beach that's sort of sloping and has a catchment in the back and you put a sea anchor down and it will collect microplastics without collecting sea life. And um, 
There's other methods that some young people have been coming up with. I don't think there's time to really describe them all, but it is an area for good innovation. You want to figure out ways that don't use power and that don't disrupt ocean life, but that do attack the ocean plastics. And I just wanted to add, no more plastic is the way I feel, and all the bioplastics and different things need to be very carefully investigated because many of them have terrible chemicals, many of them don't degrade unless they're in waste streams that don't exist. So just getting rid of all throwaway plastics and all types of plastic that is not going to be a somewhat permanent useful thing, I just assume no plastic. Thank, thank you. I think we're. Questions from the beginning. I don't know. If one, what? Time for one more. She had a question right in the beginning. Uh, my understanding is that China is no longer buying their plastic Yeah, one of the biggest effects on on uh, the whole plastics movement was China deciding not to. All that plastic recycling was actually plastic being shipped and burned in China. And now that China is a developed nation, they decided they didn't want Western trash. And it's very interesting, uh, John Hosevar, who's director of Greenpeace, said that uh, for years they've been trying to like get conversations going with Coca-Cola and Starbucks and others. And within weeks of China um, saying we're not taking Western plastic waste anymore, and the backup and the breakdown of recycling centers in the West, suddenly they were getting callbacks from all the major corporations. So corporate accountability means accounting for the full life cycle. And China was a way of externalizing our pollution in the form of pollution in China for what we were consuming here. That no longer works. Um, there's no longer any away. So throw anything away. It's all with us. Uh, microplastic and uh, invasive species and melting glaciers and ice will be with us the rest of our lives and generations to come. But we do some good triage and uh, we might survive it um, and, and build some hope for the future. Um, and on that pragmatically optimistic uh, thing, I'd suggest that for more information, if you're interested, Blue Frontiers, www.bluefront.org. Ocean Voyages Institute is www.oceanvoyagesinstitute.org. Um, Air Store Oceans is www.h2oo.org, and we're on Facebook and Instagram. What about Snapchat? We are not on Snapchat, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, we're at biologicaldiversity.org, and I think we've sued the Trump administration 150 times now. So. <laughs> Thank you guys.